Hello, my name is John Stoltz, Director of Customer Experience for the Association for Supply Chain Management, and I'll be your host for today's webinar, The Convergence of Compliance. I'm pleased to be joined by Charles Thomas, Director of Anti-Bribery and Corruption at LexisNexis Risk Solutions. Charles has global expertise in areas including the convergence of risk and compliance management, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and the UK Bribery Act. Prior to LexisNexis Risk Solutions, Charles worked for the Risk and Compliance Division of Dow Jones and held a role in the Background Screening Division of Kroll. Charles was one of our highly rated presenters at last year's annual conference. In today's webinar, he's presenting that top-rated content, exploring how and where do you find the common ground that you can make compliance a real benefit to your business. We'd also like to remind you that registration for this year's annual conference, ASCM 2019, is now open. Please join us in Las Vegas from September 16th through 18th. Today's webinar attendees can take advantage of a special discounted offer of $50 off your full conference registration. Use discount code LVWEB50. This discount can be applied to currently discounted early registration pricing that ends July 31st, so register today. Please visit ASCMconference.org for more information. We're delighted to share such exceptional insights and learnings with the ASCM community and it is now my pleasure to present Charles Thomas. Excellent, thank you very much, John, and thank you to everyone for taking the time to listen. Um, as John mentioned, I'm gonna to touch on the topic of the convergence of compliance with a primary focus on anti-bribery and corruption, which is my world, uh, the world in which I work in, and how that can impact on the supply chain world, both from a negative perspective, but also perhaps crucially from a positive perspective. Um, whenever we talk about compliance and within LexisNexis Risk Solutions, we, we spend our time around the world talking about financial crime compliance. A large part of what we discuss is, is the bad stuff that will happen. There will be some bad stuff. I will certainly be touching on that bad stuff because it would be foolish not to. But I also want to take some time to focus on the positive outcomes that can, that can be derived from a good compliance process. As John mentioned, uh, my background is in risk before compliance. Um, and I come from a due diligence background. And I focus very much globally. So I live and work in the United Kingdom, but I have a, a global role that focuses from all the way from Australia, first thing in the morning to Hawaii, late at night, helping our clients, the market, understand, address the problems of regulation and crucially of enforcement within the anti-bribe and corruption space. I'm part of a team that focuses on what we call financial crime compliance, and I'll touch on different points of that as we go through. Firstly, I wanted to start to talk about some of the regulations that exist in this world. Quite often, supply chain can be a little isolated from the compliance world, and the hope here is to shine a bit of a light on that and give an overview and give a feel of what else is out there and how it can have an impact. So if I started off with some of the, um, the potential I suppose the potential groups out there that might be enforcing this activity, um, it's often thought that the only anti-bribery and corruption regulation in the world is the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the FCPA. It's true to say that the FCPA is the strongest and it's the most regularly enforced act and it's enforced by the Securities and Exchanges Commission and the Department of Justice in the US. And it was, it's been around for a long time. It's been around since the early 70s and it's a very strong, very powerful piece of regulation. That powerful piece of regulation is one that really has a strong impact worldwide. It's not just a US law, it's a strong impact worldwide. But there are countless other regulations and enforcements within the anti-bribery and corruption world which will and do have an impact on your world. Wherever you operate, however you operate, especially if you have any international footprint in your supply chain, if you're bringing goods or services from anywhere internationally, you will encounter one of these many bodies. Now obviously I couldn't put all of the enforcement agencies on one slide because there's too many out there, so I just picked a few at random to illustrate the breadth. So I have the Serious Fraud Office of the UK alongside the Serious Fraud Office of New Zealand, for example. We have the Chinese criminal um, enforcement agencies, the Agence Française Anticorruption in France who are gaining powers um, more rapidly than perhaps any organization. Um, I think my favorite here is the Hawks. Um, the Hawks is the South African um, organization charged with tackling corruption and bribery within South Africa. Um, I think they're my favorite because they have the best name, 
um, but also because they replaced a previous organization called the Scorpions. I think it's safe to say that South Africa has stolen a march on naming their organizations beyond everyone else. So when I began, I wanted to talk about, I mentioned I was going to talk about the, the penalties for getting it wrong. What's the cost, the real cost, if you have a breach, if you have a bribery or corruption enforcement action against you? And I'm going to begin with one small example that comes from Australia. Um, this is an example of a hydroelectric power scheme in the snowy mountains um, outside Sydney, Australia. And it was found that one of the engineering firms involved in that was potentially involved in bribery and corruption. And there was a, a big case, it's, it's been dragged out a bit, about whether or not there was, this was in there. The cost, however, here, and the interesting reason behind this story is, it, it's actually got, it's an Australian term, which is tall poppy syndrome. They talk about the tall poppy. And the tall poppy is the, the propensity for a culture to always try and bring down the biggest player in a scheme. Now in this scheme, in this hydroelectric scheme, the biggest player was certainly not the engineering firm that was contracted to do this work. The biggest player was the then Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull. So the press, the media, whenever they were reporting, it was his name that was put on the front. Now this carries over into the corporate world that when there's an issue with a supply chain failing, a supply chain problem that's linked to bribery or corruption, one thinks of the, the dreadful um, building collapse in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, which killed many hundreds of people, but was linked to and had heavy issues about both human trafficking, slavery, and corruption. It was the brands, it was the names that were being manufactured in those buildings that went on the front page. They are the tall poppy, they are the ones that are gonna get the bad publicity, not the small people at the back of the room doing the dodgy deals. We then have another case here in the UK, um, which is fairly, fairly small, but it shows that this is not just a, a criminal or civil criminal issue, it's also a criminal issue. And in this case, somebody was found for to, to be guilty of taking bribes to interfere in a drug trial in Scotland and was sent to jail for six years. So there are now, as well as the, that reputational risk, there are prison sentences for people getting it wrong. We also have a very a huge ongoing, seemingly never-ending case in Latin America, and I apologize in advance to any Portuguese speakers, because my Portuguese is, is terrible, but it's called, called Operacion Lava Jato, um, and Lava Jato translates briefly as car wash, and it's, it's an ongoing, multifaceted, multi-country investigation into bribery and corruption. Now, the Mexican government have banned a business called Odebrecht from doing any business with government in Mexico. Um, Odebrecht were linked to the corruption scandal, the Lava Jato scandal. The crucial thing here is the Mexican government has said, you're not allowed to do any business. Well, Odebrecht are a construction company, um, and this means that a construction company is not able to do any business within one of the fastest growing economies there is. Uh, Mexico is a fast growing economy, there's a lot of construction work, there's a lot of investment, and Odebrecht are no longer allowed to be involved in that as a result of being involved in bribery and corruption. We then have another example from Australia, um, another one that's quite a good example, and it's an, an Australian building, it's um, in Melbourne, and it was a uh, university halls of residence, so like a lodging for university students in Australia that was bought and sold between a group of Malaysian government officials repeatedly to inflate the price and they then cashed out. So they took their money, they made, it, uh, made several corrupt real estate deals and then cashed out. This is sometimes referred to as the Vancouver model because it's been seen quite heavily in Vancouver, particularly with money coming from the likes of China and Russia, but in this case, Malaysia. Um, and it's a way of laundering money by using corrupt means to legitimize that money. Um, this actual case here was, strangely, the, some of the individuals here were named in the Panama Papers. Um, so there's a crossover between perfectly legitimate business, but also people moving their money. And it's where that, where that legitimate business changes into illegitimate business is where the risk lies. And then there's the pure, uh, pure, it's a terrible word to describe it, but um, the, the traditional monetary bribes. 
So an example here of Keppel Offshore, who were an offshore drilling company based in Singapore, who paid a, a hefty fine, 422 million, to end a bribe uh, into a probe into bribery cases. There have been many other cases, high volume, high value cases found. The the poster child, as it were, of this was Siemens, who many years ago were fined 800 million US dollars for breaches in the, of bribery and corruption. That had a huge impact on their business from a financial perspective, but as we'll see later on, there were other issues that came to call, came to haunt them because of that as well. And then finally, there's the um, there's a reputational knock-on effect. There was a case in China uh, about four or five years ago now uh, where GlaxoSmithKline had um, some issues and some problems around um, part of their due diligence process not quite working as it should, bribes being paid, and as a result, people were jailed in China. So people representing GlaxoSmithKline were jailed. But it's not just Glaxo that are now struggling, but some of their rivals and some of their peers in the industry are also struggling to deal with the aftermath of, of a problem, of a case against them. And that is where we, we look at the issues beyond the fines. There are big fines, that 422 million for um, Keppel, for example, Siemens, there have been others recently, Vimplecom, lots of names out there who have been bribed. They invariably, almost always involve third parties. So a bribe being paid to or for or by a third party. But beyond that, what is the beyond the fines that can cause, that should cause people to be, keep awake at night and worry? We found a lot of other issues um, in this when we've been conducting research into the market impacts of a bribery and, research, bribery and corruption case. We found that there are other more more serious impacts than just a fine. And these can go on much more long, much more longer lasting, and they can have a much deeper impact than a fine. The first of those is a reputational issue. There's a big reputational damage. This is especially true with anyone involved in the consumer goods environment. So if you're involved in something that is sold to a consumer, um, there's been a ton of research published that millennials want to buy from good companies. They want to buy from companies that have a transparent approach to things. So I think perhaps my favorite example of that, of a positive example, would be a company called Patagonia, who are a, an outdoor equipment and clothing manufacturer. Some years ago, they found a problem with um, their, their workforce, had some workforce issues. They went out and solved those issues and then took on a, a view of what they called radical transparency. And that radical transparency was them putting everything in the open. Yes, we had a problem, here's how we solved it. They're able to actually now trade on that, improve reputation as a result of admitting their faults. It's quite an extreme approach. You don't necessarily want to find a fault to have to admit one, but it can be there that you can, you can claw back from that reputational damage. There's then a, it's a financial issue, but a huge erosion of market value. I mentioned Siemens earlier, and in, I think, around the six months after their case was announced, they lost around 50% of their share price. Um, that's like a, a boat stopping dead in the water. So if a boat's moving through the water, it's all going along fine, you can keep progressing. If you lose, lose 50% of your momentum, your share price, your, anything, you, you stop dead, and it takes a long time to get going again. That can have a huge impact. There's then the potential for being blocked out of opportunities. I mentioned on the previous slide Odebrecht, who are no longer able to be involved or involved in government work in Mexico, but it can actually go beyond that. You can be blocked from new market opportunities because your compliance process doesn't necessarily match up to what your clients want or they're, what they're expecting. And it can also cause real-term relationships. It can have a, a real negative impact to people who you've bought and sold from for many years. Um, in the supply chain world, it might be someone you've, you've relied on for just-in-time supply for some years. And if they saw that you were corrupt, they might not want to do business with you anymore. And that can have a big problem. We've then seen a, a human impact of this as well. There's a, there's a drain of talent. People don't want to work for bad companies. I go back to the millennial comment earlier. Millennials, particularly if they're the growing strength of the workforce worldwide, do not want to be involved with working with bad companies. They're willing to actually work for less 
to work at a, at a good company. So if you have an issue where you are involved in bribery and corruption, you will inevitably lose some staff because people may not want to work with you anymore. You'll then inevitably also lose the momentum of those staff and the employees, but the work that those employees would be doing. Furthermore, you'll find it much harder to replace those employees. So the momentum gets even harder to regain. We've actually found there was a, a, another construction company called CH2M Hill who were quoted as saying that they found it very difficult to hire talent. They were finding it hard to hire talent because their industry was perceived to be corrupt. Not that they were corrupt, or which they're not, and not that they themselves were corrupt, but their industry was perceived to be corrupt. And as a result of that, they were finding it hard to attract talent. Beyond that, there's the potential for an ongoing supervision cost or a compliance monitor coming in to keep an eye on your situation after the event. That can cause disruption to your everyday workflow because it's another layer of, I say bureaucracy, but necessary bureaucracy that you have to have within that. Potential for personal liability or jail time. And this is increasing with certain pieces of legislation, which I'll come on to in a moment, that if you, as an employee, fail to prevent bribery, and you as a company fail to prevent bribery, you as an employee and you as a company can be liable for this. And we've seen comments coming out of the Department of Justice in the US. Um, we've also seen comments coming from other enforcement agencies saying that it's increasingly difficult to prosecute companies, but it is getting more interesting to prosecute individuals. I sat on a, on a, in on a panel discussion at a conference uh, last year where someone from the, the CIA sat down and proudly said that he, he, he was a people person. And he said it with a slightly menacing grin. And he said, I love arresting people. And I thought that's, that's quite a statement of intent there, that they're, they're looking to go after people as well. So when I mentioned the, the, that personal liability piece and the fact that it can be failure to prevent, it's a good time to move on and look at what the actual laws are and what they, what they mean to you as a business. We could start, for example, with the USA. Now, in the USA, the main piece of legislation is the Foreign and Corrupt Practices Act, the FCPA. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's been around since the early 70s, and it's hugely influential, and it's a hugely powerful piece of law. Effectively, it outlaws paying a bribe to a foreign public official or an instrumentality of state. So this means paying a bribe to, loosely interpreted, anyone who works for a government or a government agency. So a good example of this in the supply chain world would be whenever you're moving goods across borders, they're going through customs agents, port agents, border control agents. Those individuals, if they're employed by a government, are a foreign public official. If you pay a bribe to that border agent to get your container through the border quicker, that is a bribe under the Foreign, on the, under the foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So it's quite specific about bribe, bribery of foreign public officials and government. To comply with it, you have to have adequate due diligence. You have to have what are called good books and records. So you need to be able to show what you knew about all of your third parties. So that's third parties, which are suppliers, vendors, sales agents. So in this context, you have to have really good books and records of the due diligence that was done on any, any point of your supply chain. And then you also have to have what's called training and communication. So every company should have, I hope everyone listening has had, really solid training on how to avoid bribery, how to prevent bribery, what bribery actually is and what it means. So the USA has been the strong player for, for some years. The UK in 2010 brought out something called the United Kingdom Bribery Act. Um, now, this is sometimes abbreviated to UKBA or just the Bribery Act. And it goes beyond what's required in the USA in that it makes no distinction between the payer of a bribe and the recipient of a bribe. And it makes no distinction between whether that person is government employed or government controlled or a private entity. So it, it, it criminalizes, if you will, both sides of that, both sides of the coin. There are certain things you have to do to be able to comply. And one of those compliance pieces is due diligence. You have to have carried out adequate due diligence into all third parties. And that's a real common theme, as you can see as we go through these. You also have to have ongoing monitoring and ongoing review of your process, and that includes ongoing monitoring and review of your due diligence. 
another point where the supply chain world can potentially help bring that due diligence and bring that information in to the compliance world. It has what's called proportionality, which is a, a typically British, I have to say typically British, I am British, so I'm going to say that, it's a typically British common sense approach to doing things. Your due diligence should be proportional to the risk of doing business. But also, if you're taking someone out for dinner, then the dinner should be proportionate to the meal and, and the relationship you have with them. So if I was about to sign a contract with Bill Gates to do all of the compliance program for Microsoft, for example, I might not take him out to McDonald's for dinner. I might take him somewhere a little bit nicer. That would be perfectly legitimate. Um, if I was taking someone out for dinner and I took them out to the finest restaurant in the land and bought them, bought them $3,000 bottles of wine and the deal was only worth a million dollars a year, then people would start to ask questions. So proportionality is key. One of the other common pieces and the other common factors between the USA and the UK is they apply extraterritorially. So both of these apply to any US or UK citizen, any US or UK company, any transaction carried out in US dollars or UK sterling, or even, it could even go down as far as any server transaction, so any email going through a server location in the UK or the USA. So they have real reach beyond the, the realms of just the US or just the UK. I picked two other countries to look at to give you an idea of some of the other laws that are out there and some of the other things that are out there. But it's really to give a flavor that every country has a law that outlaws bribery and corruption. Every country is now, we're now seeing countries increasingly work together. So you may see multiple country enforcements coming into place. And I chose France. Um, partly because I'm a French speaker, but also partly because I think it's a very interesting law, which is, it's called Sapin de, and Sapin is the name of the minister who brought it in, de, for those that don't speak French, is French for two, so it's Sapin de, it's his second law on this. It outlaws paying and receiving a bribe. It outlaws, it makes a di no difference to state and private, just like the UK. It does only apply, though, to quite a narrow band of French companies. So it's almost like they've slightly missed a trick here. They could have gone a bit broader, they didn't. But one of the things it has which is hugely powerful is they have a mandatory policy. So you as a company have to have a policy to have a proper compliance procedure in place, have it all documented, have it all laid out. And the Agence Française Anticorruption, their enforcing body, has the power to turn up on your doorstep, knock on the door at 7 o'clock in the morning and demand to see your policy. If your policy isn't good enough, then you can be fined or have a sentence brought against you, just for a failure of your policy. If no bribe has been paid, no issues have been done, they can still come after you for that, and that's hugely powerful. Australia is perhaps the most recent example where they're kind of picking and almost picking the best bits of all of them. So it's still extraterritorial, like the US and the UK. It still has the, um, the foreign public official piece where you have to know if you're dealing with government or government officials. But one of the things it takes on from the UK is the term of failure to prevent. Now, failure to prevent is it's a, a criminal, it's a discrete criminal offence under the UK Bribery Act and, in, and from Australia with their new laws that says if you as a company or an individual allow bribery to happen, so if you fail to prevent it, then you are complicit in that crime and you can be arrested and or charged. That means that having proper policies in place and having those flowing down through all of the parts of a business are ever more important, more important than ever. So if we take the anti-bribe and corruption world, of which I've just tried to give a snapshot there, there are other laws that come into play that have a huge impact here, which overlap. And I, I've, I've picked out a few of these. Again, I, there's so many overlapping factors within this financial crime compliance world that it can be a big rabbit hole to go down. But try to focus on some that will be really relevant here in this space. Now, one of these is called CATSA, which is Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act. Um, and this was a, a, an act last year to really renew focus on what was seen as bad players um, by the American government. And one of the biggest factors on this is that there is a piece within CATSA which outlaws the use of North Korean, North Korean labor at any point in the supply chain. So if you have goods or services, or goods or products rather, which are made by North Korean labor, 
those goods or products are not allowed to enter US soil. And this creates a real problem for, um, for supply chains and for due diligence in the compliance space, in that it may well be that that North Korean labor is perfectly legally employed in, uh, I'm trying to give an example, there were some, some shipyards in Poland that were using North Korean labor. And they were doing it legally. These people were sent from North Korea to Poland to work, and they sent their money home. Now, under CAPSA, those individuals are classified as slave labor, and therefore not allowed. So it's very hard to, to, to identify that. One of the problems of this is there's no list. You, no one publishes, we employ North Koreans. So it really places the pressure on compliance-led due diligence and supplier-led due, due diligence to dig down into that world. There's then the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act, which is much like the, the UK Act. It's aimed at trying to prevent slavery and trafficking. Now, why slavery and tra trafficking is so important in the supply chain and compliance world is the overlapping connection between them. It's almost like a moving pie chart. If there is human trafficking somewhere in your supply chain, it's very likely that there is also bribery or corruption. If there is slavery somewhere in your, in your supply chain, if, if forced labor is being used, it's quite possible that somebody is actually laundering the proceeds of that money. So there's money laundering in there as well. These things all get interconnected. I have included here modern slavery, and I've included that in parentheses, because the UK has a modern slavery act, and if I'm allowed a personal bugbear on these things, I think I'm going to take one. There's nothing modern about slavery. Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's not modern. It's just slavery. And hopefully there's a move towards people getting to really try and stamp out on this because of that interconnectedness and because of trying to make things better for everyone. There's then the world of sanctions and sanctioned goods and products. Um, ever-increasing sanctions and changing sanctions landscape, particularly coming out of the US government where things can change very rapidly. There's also renewed focus on non worlds. Invariably, it was the banks, the financial services industry that was looked at for sanctions compliance. But we're now seeing more and more focus on corporate entities in this world as well. We then touched on the conflict minerals issue. So conflict minerals, um, they, they, as an issue, they've slightly died down over the recent years, which is a shame, because I think it still needs a spotlight shone on it, again, for that interconnectivity of financial crime. Um, working to stamp out conflict minerals is, is part of protecting human rights. It's part of protecting humanitarian law. It's part of protecting people. And that's got to be a good thing. And then if you layer on top of that the idea of corporate social responsibility, which, again, is becoming ever more imp important either from a, a reputation point of view, from an environmental impact point of view. Um, we're seeing more and more initiatives to promote good values within businesses. All of these things can get layered into the process. So how can you find a common ground within that process? How can you find a way to, to actually make, make this come together? Well, there are a few things that are pretty much key across all of these, and this is likely to fit within a supply chain evaluation process and the compliance process. The first of those is to carry out risk assessment. So what is the risk of this, this supplier? What is the risk of this business relationship? Once that's been done, having a program that's properly documented and implemented and in place is vital. Back to that failure to prevent. If you have the documented process and you follow it, you have not failed to prevent. Due diligence is an absolute common ground, not only for all of the anti-bribing corruption regulations that I mentioned, for all of the slavery and trafficking regulations, but also for any entering into any business relationship, any new supplier that comes on board, due diligence is going to be vital. But due diligence is not a, a one and done. It's not a, a simple static process. It has to be linked to ongoing monitoring. A is a good and trusted vendor you've worked with for 10 years tomorrow could be involved in a bribery and corruption scandal in Vietnam. The next day they might be involved in a, an environmental spill in Turkey. Whatever it may be, you need to be able to, to know about that. You also need to have a solid process for suspicious matter reporting, um, so reporting these issues. It's increasingly seen that within anti-bribery and corruption, if you identify a problem and report it ac accurately and honestly, that actually stands you in very good stead for enforcement. The enforcement agencies will look away from you. Well, not look away, that's maybe the wrong, wrong word. They will look more kindly on your issue. 
And then there's also got to be a monitoring and review process of the whole process. So while we have a nice straight line of arrows following along here, in reality this should be a circle. It should be a circular process that keeps on going. If we took um, a view of some of the other common ground. Now, I, I work in an industry that loves an acronym. So there's, there's a few acronyms to try and get through here, and I'll try to make sure I do de decipher them all. Anti-money laundering is always seen as a foundation point of financial crime compliance. It's the, the more established piece of the world, and it's the one that actually has, in some cases, the biggest bite. And that's really looking to see if you're dealing with sanctioned entities, sanctions, if you have any political exposure, people who are politically exposed, if you're working with their relatives and associates, so the RNA, the people linked to those PEPs or potentially linked to the sanctioned entities, and also looking at adverse media information. One of the great things about the modern digital world is there is so much information out there. One of the difficult things is thinning down that information to something relevant. So being able to focus an adverse media search on information that is relevant to you can help you really work on that. To build that out into an anti-bribing and corruption world, the real thing you need to be looking at is maybe slightly adjusting the focus on your adverse media. You might be looking at slightly different topics, slightly different issues. You might be wanting to focus more on is the traffic in slavery in my supply chain because that will have a link to um, a link to bribing and corruption. But you need to be looking at what are called state-owned entities. So is, is this company owned or controlled by a government? but also looking at the employees, so the management of those state-owned entities. Now, it's not realistic and not feasible to look at every employee of the government everywhere. Um, I think from memory, the Indian Railway, which is a wholly state-owned entity, has something like, something like six or seven million employees at any one time. So you couldn't possibly look at all of those employees, but you would be able to identify the management and senior levels. And then you can go beyond that to add a risk and sort of a risk and reputational view where you might be looking at your supply chain risk management platform, bringing that information as well, but also the corporate social responsibility piece as well. By building all those layers in together, you can actually make a really big, thorough, and comprehensive view of the risks you're, you're facing in any relationship. The only problem is this is work. Um, and this always has puts a pressure on compliance functions. Particularly in the corporate space, compliance functions are pressurized. They do not have the huge numbers that a bank has. Um, some of the large banks in the US, up to 20 or 25% of their employees are in compliance nowadays. In a corporate world, you may find there might be one or two people in compliance. And they're sitting at the back of the room tearing their hair up because they've got so much work to do because they have so many third parties. And they have so many different international pieces they have to work on. And it can also be seen as a cost center. Um, doing this due diligence, doing anything there. Oh, we don't have want to do due diligence because we just need to get this supplier signed up. We need this, we need this partner in Turkey. We need this supplier to send us these pieces from Canada, whatever it may be. It's seen as a barrier to doing business. And that can put the pressure on you. There's then the, the, the pressure of com combining all those multiple compliance regimes and bringing them all together. It can sometimes be a challenge to do that. But if a compliance team can focus on some core skills, some core functions, then actually you can bring those pieces together. By having a solid due diligence program with a baseline across the board of every every relationship, every person you touch and come into contact with having some piece of due diligence, you're able to actually simplify that process. By having a global approach, we have a global standardized level that you can work to, again, you can simplify that process and simplify the audit trail to bring it into one piece. And if you tie that in with the commitment from the top, there's, a, there's an often overused term in compliance, which is tone from the top. I don't think it can really be overused you have to have full commitment and you have to have full buy-in across the book from the board level all the way down that you're going to do this. If you can focus on these key core efforts and these core pieces, then you can actually help to turn compliance into a benefit. Now, this was the piece that I think we, 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 we like to touch on differently, LexisNexis Risk Solutions, where yes, there's the negative and yes, there's the fine. How can you help yourself do better? Um, 
I, I have an obligation to use at least one quote in Latin in every presentation I do, and here I have one which is sometimes attributed to Francis Bacon, but it's actually a mistranslation of something from a, an Arabic scholar much, much earlier than that. Scientia potentiaris, knowledge is power. Now, if you have solid knowledge of all of your relationships, that knowledge will lead to a better relationship. If you really know who you're doing business with, you can lead to a better developed relationship with them. It can be helped to work, work on price and service. So if you know more about your suppliers, surely you can work to, to get a better deal from them, if that is on prices that it is on service. But from a reputation perspective as well, if you work to have, if you have a better compliance process, your suppliers will want to work with you more as well. We're seeing a real move at the moment, particularly in China, where companies in China are looking to really cement and solidify their compliance processes as a competitive advantage. So they want to be seen to be the compliant supplier. Um, this is increasingly important where non-Chinese companies are looking to China for production of goods, um, because historically it's been high quality and low cost, so let's get stuff made in China. If you're going and you're looking at three suppliers, if one of those suppliers has a really solid compliance program, and that's what they lead with, they don't lead with their cost or their production, they come in and say, look, this is why we're important, because we comply, that's got to be a better service and better relationship. Touching into the idea of combining efforts, a lot of the due diligence that's done on a supply chain risk management tool, that information and that due diligence will, will be totally relevant to a compliance program. And a lot of the due diligence and information that's done on a compliance program, that will be totally relevant to a supply chain risk management program. Rarely, or well not rarely, but not as often as we'd like to see, are those things shared. So as we're reaching the world of big data and better information sharing, you can tie less processes, do, do fewer things, but get better outcomes and better results. So if you're doing due diligence for compliance, share that information, share that knowledge across to the other areas. And ultimately, all of this and all of this due diligence and information and noticing and knowing who you're doing business with is about prevention. It's not a cure. Um, I don't think it's fair to say we're ever going to completely stop bribery and corruption because human beings are unfortunately quite unpleasant people. But it is absolutely true that if you have a solid compliance program and you share that information, you're protecting your reputation as a business. Now that reputation is something that you as a company work for every day. It's so easy to lose it, but it's really, really not that hard to protect it. Now, one of the things that I find that's strange, and I just wanted to end on a Slightly personal note, but I think it sets out the scheme of why this is important. And actually, when I when I presented this at the conference in Chicago, um, I had somebody come up to me afterwards and said this was perhaps a bit that, that hit home. Um, incidentally, he actually asked how he could get a job in compliance as a result of hearing the presentation. So maybe it did have an impact. Um, why does it matter? So why does all this matter? We talk about anti-bribery and corruption. We talk about compliance and laws. And this goes back to moving house recently, or relatively recently. I moved from a small village to a, an old farmhouse in the countryside, and that meant moving pubs. Now, in Britain, a pub is it's a bit like Cheers. It's a place where everyone knows your name. Um, I had a new pub, and I only knew a couple of people who, who go to this pub. Walked in, got talking to someone. He said, a friend of a friend said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I work in anti-bribery and corruption. He said, well, what does that mean? I had to try and explain it. And I thought of an example to try and explain it, which is a family called the Obiang family. Now, we're using some stock images here just to give you an idea. Um, the Obiang family are the, or have been the ruling family of Equatorial Guinea. Um, Equatorial Guinea is a country in Africa. It has the highest GDP per head of population in Africa. And the son of the president, um, a chap called Theodore Obiang, was for some time the Minister of Forestry or as he turned, turned himself the Minister of Chopping Down Trees. And while on a ministerial salary of around 100,000 US dollars a year, he was able to obtain two Rolls Royces, three Ferrari Enzos, two Bugatti Veyrons, houses in Malibu, apartments in the nicest addresses in Paris. Um, that money was quite clearly coming from somewhere. He also had, and this is, I not one of them, it's a stock image, but he had multiple yachts. 
not just yacht, a yacht, but multiple yachts worth millions of dollars each. So what was happening there was that the money which should have been going into Equatorial Guinea and being invested in forestry, being invested in infrastructure and industry, was going into someone else's back pocket. It wasn't going into making the business do well. So again, why does this matter? Well, somebody's getting rich. Well, of course he is. But the problem is the reality of life in Equatorial Guinea is very different. Equatorial Guinea has one of the lowest um, levels of sanitation, one of the lowest levels of clean running water, even in the urban areas, let alone in the, in the rural areas. And it has people who are struggling, who are on the breadline, people for whom this kind of reality is, is there, that they're living in shacks and they're not necessarily getting the life they need. Now what this means is all those companies that were investing in forestry or work or infrastructure projects, when they were going in, yeah, it's pretty true they were paying bribes. But what that meant was those bribes were going to line the pocket of a rich few. Those bribes were not going to actually make their investments more effective. So as a company, paying a bribe is a very ineffective way of getting business done. It's a very expensive way to get a very small advantage. Far better to actually invest more heavily and more effectively in something more thorough. And there's one very strong example of this, which was a one of the big box retail outlets who were entering a new country. They were going into a new country and said, we're going to build our outlets. The government said yes. And just as they were about to open, a government official said, you need to pay me so that I'll turn your electricity on. And they said, no, we're not going to pay the bribe. And they stood their ground. They stood their ground for about six months. Eventually, the government official received pressure from higher up saying, it's far better to have the investment than to have a bribe in your back pocket. And that's ultimately what this is about. It's about finding ways to ensure that bribery and corruption can be minimized in the corporate supply chain and minimized in the corporate world so that your investments and your businesses can be more efficient, but also so you can help bring people up and bring people on to a much more effective and better way of working. So with that, I'm going to just wind down slowly. I think I'll hand back to John. We have a, hopefully a couple of questions to take from the end. Very good, uh, Charles. Thank you. Very, very powerful content, and um, and and very timely and relevant uh, for certain. Um, yeah, you know, as you're going through this, I, I'm just wondering, in from your perspective, um, with with the advent of you know AI and blockchain and and all these new technology solutions, uh, disruptors, if you will, it, it, does that create more opportunity for even more risk? Um, or corruption, or is the flip side that these are the tools that will allow uh, more effective compliance management of, of this situation? It, it's Thankfully, it's more likely to be the latter, John. Um, the likes of AI and blockchain, machine learning, um, are helping companies like us and therefore are, are to access more information more effectively. Um, so, I mentioned partway through talking about how wonderful the digital age is and how there's more information out there. So AI is actually helping people mine that information more effectively and get into better detail with less effort. So that's got to be a help. The cryptocurrency world um, is, is an interesting one and whether or not that has an impact on the bribery and corruption space is, is, is yet to be seen. In anti-money laundering terms, it is creating some risks and some issues as it's becoming more mainstream. But again, thankfully, because there's more transparency and there's more information, that information is helping to shine a light on those murky dealings. Great. That's uh, yeah. The the other thing you 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 spent some time talking about slavery, and and it's just such a growing area of interest across the supply chain. Do do you have a sense of how big an issue it is, and 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 what realistically? can be done to, to solve for this or minimize or eradicate? Yeah, I think the answer to this is how big an issue is it? Sadly, it is an issue. I think that's probably the, the best answer. And sadly, it's too, it, it's too big of an issue, really. It's, it too big, it's bigger than it should be. Um, we see a lot of cases. There's been some work done recently in the United Kingdom, which I think is fascinating, on car washing. And... Well, a, a, religion, a church organization set up a scheme to investigate car washing and hand car washers. And they worked out that if you were paying under, I think it was under about 10 pounds, which is, I don't know what the exchange rate is these days, but if you're paying under 10 pounds to have your car washed by people, 
there is no possible way that those people were being paid a living wage. Therefore, those people were in some form of servitude. And thankfully, there are more and more bodies that are shining, again, I use the term shining a light on it, but exposing this. Um, there have been some cases in the US around nail bars, where it's quite clearly people involved in forced labor or peonage or slavery, whatever terms you use to describe it. So it is, it is more of a problem than it should be. And sadly, it's not a problem just in far-fung places. It's a problem closer to home. It's probably a problem in your town. You might not be seeing it. You might not be aware of that issue. But there are probably people in your town who are slaves. That's a bad thing. So how can we eradicate it? Well, back to the concept of due diligence. Conducting real due diligence and real research and investigations and knowing what's happening with suppliers, with your supply chain, is vital. Um, the corporate world can help do that at a high level, at a big level, but thankfully we're also seeing now the rise of citizen concern, I think we could call it, where people want to do it themselves. They want to investigate. They want to know. They want to establish their own information. Um, there's a brilliant sort of link to this. There's a brilliant piece in India, which is ipaidabribe.com, which is this wonderful crowdsourced um, information resource of showing who's paying a bribe where and how. We're now seeing that kind of rise coming. I mentioned the, the, the church organization in the UK. We're now seeing that kind of rise coming to, to again, illustrate and show where slavery is and hopefully highlight those problems. So I, I go back to the central theme that more information is going to help us. I think more information is going to help. Will it ever be eradicated? Sadly not, because as I mentioned earlier, humans are terrible. <laughs> Right. You, you, you mentioned uh, financial institutions and, and, you know, having huge, you know, uh, contingents of folks working on, on compliance. And, and then we think about the supply chain and, and it's, a, you know, obviously a much, much smaller group of people that, that uh, you know, are hopefully, um, you know, putting compliance as part of the lens of how they, they look at the supply chain and, and secondary suppliers and tertiary suppliers and whatnot. But uh, is, is, do you have a sense of how much due diligence is enough to, to be considered adequate? Or, you know, where, where do we draw the line? Or, or do we? This is, this, well, I don't, this is one of, my, one of my favorite and least favorite questions in, in the same breath John um, how much is enough well I think I go back to the UK bribery act and the guidance on proportionality and there are some really solid guidance notes which are available from the Ministry of Justice in the UK um, that, that outline what this means and I think it can be applied anywhere and a lot of it is down to common sense um, being a British law a lot of it is about common sense I like that so how much due diligence is enough well as a business you you know you do know the risk of a supplier. So if that supplier is the company that brings flowers into your head office reception area, then the risk is minimal. You really just need to know, are, are they who they say they are? You know, can, we, can we establish they're a good trading company and they're, they're sourcing their flowers in a way that you like? It's not much. But if it's a company who are providing a mission-critical manufacturing process for you that is a multi-million dollar process, well, you have to do a lot more. You, you would it, it, the risk and potential reward equation means you'd have to do a lot more due diligence. But one of the things that's fundamental to that is is tied into all of the anti-bribery and corruption legislation is having a baseline standard. You need to make sure you're doing some due diligence on every relationship at a at a at a good level. It doesn't have to be doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be time consuming. It just has to be something that shows that you're making the right efforts and trying to pinpoint those problems. And where it's a higher risk relationship, mission critical manufacturing of heavy machinery, then yes, you will need to dive deeper into that process. Where it's a lower risk, you can probably just stick with your baseline due diligence. But you do have to have a baseline across the board which shows a good knowledge of the information behind your third parties. So how much is enough? Unfortunately, it comes down to an individual company's risk appetite and risk approach, but some standard baseline is is an essential. Great, um, and just time for for one one final question. Uh, you know, is as 
if we think of a company uh, multinational operating across the globe and then an enterprise uh, perhaps just operating in the in the US do, do you see different levels of concern or or are both subject to the same potential risk um, it's an interesting one it's one thing we hear occasionally and I, I hear this when I'm when I'm in the US um, which is oh, I'm, I'm an American company I only need to worry about American laws or I'm, I'm a US company and I don't work outside the US I have no I, we're just based in Missouri well that's good that's fine but I think with the supply chain world wherever there is any non-US engagement then US companies should be looking to, to make sure they know what they're doing um, by non-US engagement, it means are you sourcing goods from overseas? Are you sourcing services from overseas? If so, then either the FTPA will apply, and you need to make sure you're you're following that and, and working with that, or the relevant regulation in the country in which you're sourcing those goods will apply. So if you're sourcing materials from the UK, you might be a Missouri-based company that only sells within the US, but if you're sourcing part of that good um, or product from the UK, then the UK Bribery Act applies. So I think there's there's a that kind of think globally but act locally or act globally but think locally, they're both they're both equally valid. Um, but it's very rare that there'll be any company that has no requirement to know their compliance needs. It's very, very rare to find a company that's so small, so insular and so non that they have to do that. Excellent. Uh, well, again, Charles, thank you for uh, for taking the time to, to be uh, with us today and sharing this uh, in, in, in really powerful information. And it's and it's certainly a, you know testament to to how well the content was received at the annual conference uh, in 2018. Um, we, we do look forward to uh, seeing everyone at ASCM 2019 in Las Vegas this September. Uh, please don't forget to register using uh, promo code LVWeb. 50 to take $50 off of your conference registration fees, uh, saving you up to $450 if you register by July 31st. Uh, learn more and register today at ASCMConference.org. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for participating. All content and materials included in this ASCM online event are the property of ASCM and are protected by the United States and international copyright laws. All rights are reserved. Thank <laughs> you.